All right, I've got it. So the core okay, elements- I just, said, I just said the recording on, is that okay? Yep, yeah. saw it, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Sorry All about right. that. <laughs> So the core elements of any Shiny app, there's gonna be four lines of code that appear regardless of how you build your Shiny app. Sometimes they appear in a slightly different, um, different ways, but every app that you build is gonna have the line to have library Shiny set up to run. Then you're gonna build a UI, some sort of page. In this case, it's a fluid page. So that's going to end up building your user interface. You're going to have a line that has is builds your server object, and it's going to be a function that takes input output at minimum, plus potentially some other optional arguments. And then you're going to have a line of code, shiny app, UI server, which puts those pieces together, and it builds the communication between your user interface and your server components. So in this user interface, this is where you're going to potentially place um, any text, input widgets, say where you want your output objects like tables and plots to appear. It's also where you would write any styling instructions that all ends up going into the UI or being linked to the UI section. Whereas the server object is the part that enables communication between a web server and an R server. So it's where you're going to write your sort of more normal looking R code, if you need to have a ggplot is what you wanna put in the plot portion of your website, then you're gonna be writing some ggplot code down in the server um, function somewhere. And we're gonna run this code, gonna see that it builds an empty app, and then we're gonna take a look at it to notice that what we actually built was the beginnings of a website. So let me really quickly make our studio pop up, opens on my other monitor, and I'll pull it over. So hopefully, and let me know if I am not sharing, I should be sharing in a way that lets me switch between programs without problems. So hopefully everybody sees our studio. And we're just gonna open a regular R script for now for these exercises. Library. Shiny UI for user interface. I'm going to say that we're going to build an empty fluid page. Our server object is a function that takes input and output. And it's going to be like when we create a function in regular R. We have the round parentheses for the arguments that our function is going to take, curly braces for where we're going to ultimately end up writing a bunch of R code. And then we have shiny app, input, output as the two required arguments. And in theory, if I first save this, save as. And we're just going to put things on the desktop. As soon as we save it, because we have this line of code, the fourth line, shiny app input output, R knows that this is an app. And we have a new button that appears, run app. So I can either highlight and run my code like I might normally with control enter shortcuts, or I can hit the run app button. And it tells me that output is not found, probably because I have, oh, sorry, typo. And this is where live coding, you get to see mistakes that I made. UI and server are the two pieces. So we're building two objects, the UI and the server, and then Shiny app takes both of those to put them together. Now, if we run our app, it should be a lot happier. What it's going to do, it's going to say that it's listening. It opens up a local browser sort of window. Get it out from behind my meeting controls. And we have just an empty app with what appears to be nothing. 
I'm going to click on this option, open in browser. And we'll see that again, it opens an empty window on a local browser. But if I click on the view page, right click and click on view page source, I can see that there, I did actually create something. So I haven't put any widget input widgets, sliders and buttons in there yet. I haven't put any text in this website yet. I haven't put any output objects like plots and tables, but I have actually built a website. Um, and I think I can make this a little bigger for you to see. So we built an HTML document. It has a head section. Like most websites, if you've ever done any HTML, then some of this code will look familiar to you, potentially. But it set up a bunch of instructions. So it's saying that we're using some CS bootstrap CSS. It's setting up potentially use of some JavaScript elements. It recognizes that we're going to be building something, an HTML website using Shiny. And then we have in our body just one big empty fluid container ready to receive information. So we have, in fact, done something. Um, but the next steps that we want to do are to put something in the body of this document so that we have a more interesting application than a blank screen. Back to my PowerPoint. So the first thing we're going to put in there is potentially some user input, some of the widgets. These are the interactive pieces to receive user information. There are many, many kinds of input widgets. Um, one of the references that I'm going to use throughout this particular high level intro to Shiny app is the Shiny, Shiny cheat sheet from what was our studio, what is now Posit. Um, but on their cheat sheet, which was just recently updated, they list a number of the inputs that come with the basic Shiny library. And then others are published as add-ons through other packages. But you've got things like action buttons, you've got pull-down menus, you've got radio buttons, select boxes, that check boxes, rather numeric input, file input, submit buttons, date range input or date input, all kinds of different widgets that you can use to collect information from users. Most of them are pretty self-explanatory in terms of what they require you to add as arguments, but all of them, importantly, are going to require that you give it an input ID and usually a label. So input ID also has to be unique. So every widget that you put on your app has to have its own unique name. And it'll be that name that we use to then grab the values from them as the users enter them. Each of these inputs, what they are doing is they're making connections to JavaScript libraries and building JavaScript objects to collect that user information. So again, all of this stuff in Shiny is just wrappers for building HTML, CSS, JavaScript objects. It lets us build websites from within R. To see a little more about how these all work, there's a really great website, which is the Shiny R Studio Gallery, the widget gallery. And this link should work real quick. And what they provide there is an example of each of the different kinds of inputs. And if you pick one to see the code, it opens just a very simple example to show you both what is the behavior of that particular widget, and then what is the server code and the UI code that goes with it to make it run. So we're going to build our own. You'll see an actual example, but these are really helpful references if you wanted to build something different than what I build today. Back to the PowerPoint. So these are our input widgets. What we're going to add first to our code example is a slider input. So a slider input, think about the information, the minimum information that you need to make a slider. You're going to need to have that input ID. You're going to need to have a label that tells the user what is this slider supposed to 
represent. And then a slider always has a min and a max. And then you have the option of providing um, a default value. If you don't provide a default value, um, it will buy, it will select a value, a default value. Um, I usually like to give it one. For throughout our exercise, we're going to be using the iris data that comes with R. It's not a super exciting data set, but it's one that everybody has access to. Um, so we don't need to load any outside data. So here in our app, I'm going to make some space between these. We're just working in the UI section. The user interface is where we add our widget. So I'm going to say that we want to have a, and actually let me see if I can well, have, keep up with my notes is what I need to do. Back to R. So I'm going to have a slider input. And I'm going to give it for its unique ID, unique ID. We will call it metal slider. And we're going to ask people the label that will appear with it is going to be use a max. length, min equals min, So setting it up so that the minimum is the minimum of the available pedal lengths from the IRS data set. Maximum is the maximum of the IRS pedal length data. And for the default value that it accepts, I'm going to say that I want it to start with the maximum value and then the user can change it from there. Otherwise, I'm not going to make any changes to this app. And I can reload my app, save the selection. And now we have a simple slider. It is not yet connected to any kind of output, so we don't see any changes in our app. Um, but it is responding. I'm able to move it around. And if, again, I open in a browser to see it, instead of just the little default view within our studio, I can right click to view page source. Just to show you, we have the same HTML page with the header, same header information. But in our body, in our fluid page, we have now added a new division, a new object. That's a shiny input container. It's got a controller. It's our pedal slider label. Here's our label that goes on it. It's a JavaScript range slider, the ID pedal slider, etc with some our default values for min and max. So we've written instructions to build a JavaScript object by writing our code. So just, we now have a simple little slider. And the key things to notice on for building an input, um, if we look in our studio, at our help really quickly. This will be tiny, so I'll have to. But for our slider input, we have to provide 
the input ID, the label, the min, the max, and the value. There's lots of other things that we could modify directly about the appearance of this slider. So we could change what is the numeric step between values and restrict it to be whole numbers. Um, we could change how the tick marks are. We could make it have an animation so it moves itself around. We can change the width. Um, number of other options here. If we want to change more than what are available under the default options, we start to have to learn maybe a little bit of JavaScript to be able to modify things more deeply. Um, so there's a certain point where I have clients who sometimes when I'm going to make a Shiny app, they will be like, you really like what Shiny does, but Shiny looks sort of shiny. <laughs> and it's like, yes, and there's a certain point at which um, you can build beautiful Shiny apps. The more beautiful they are and the less they look like a Shiny app, the more it's because you know a little bit of CSS, JavaScript, or and or HTML to make deeper modifications. But you can get a long ways with just Shiny. Um, we have our simple slider. And every input, with very few exceptions, is going to be there's a slider inbox input, checkbox input. They follow the same pattern of being the name of what the widget type is and then input with a capital I. With a couple exceptions, radio buttons is different. Um, so I was going to give just, I will pause for a couple minutes for folks that may be trying to go along and code as well. And there's a quick assignment to add a second input widget. So we're not trying to connect it to anything but to make a radio buttons input that simply asks if people want to see a linear fit. And the choices are no and yes. And the default choice would be no. And what I'd suggest that you do, I'm going to open the R code so you can see what we already have, is to go to the radio buttons in help. And you will see that it has you're going to need to give it an input ID, the label, which is the question, and the choices, which will be yes or no. And I believe if you look down at the bottom, there is an example of how the code would work. So I'm going to, I have my little clock. I will give just, I think, four minutes. I will be silent and let folks play with that and then I'll carry on. If there's questions at this point, put them in the chat and Arati can let me know. Uh, Astrid, there is a question about, yeah. um, can I connect and publish Shiny outputs to a website? Not directly, not to a plain website. You need to have the difference between, if you are building something with Shiny, then you are building something that requires communication between a web server and an R server. It is crunching some data. It's a really good question, though, because there are a number of ways that you can build interactive tools in R without needing to have an R server. So examples would be you could build a leaflet um, using uh, the package leaflet. You could build a digraph. I think I have. Um, an example. So while well, those who want to code try to code, there is so HTML widgets for R. See the showcase. These are interactive graphs. There are leaflet digraphs, R bouquet, Biz Network, Biz Network 3D, etc. All of these are interactive tools. They build standalone HTML with embedded JavaScript objects that you can directly publish. You end up with some HTML code. You can directly put those onto a website. Or you could also build these inside an R Shiny app, and then they interact with data. So the difference is that these HTML widgets contain the data in themselves. So they're limited to the data that is there 
and the visualization options that you include. So like this graph um, for the leaflet contains a number of points. There's no way to turn on, to change which points you're viewing. You can zoom in and out of this leaflet to view these points, but you don't have any other additional query information built in here. There's some things that you could do with Leaflet to make it fancier, um, but they are very different. And I have clients who sometimes come for Shiny apps and then they don't really want an R server and we find ways to build it without using Shiny. So, any other questions? I have another minute for those who might be trying to code. And I think it will become clear when we build out our server section a little bit how, well, why it needs to have an R server associated with it. Um, and there was just a follow on comment that, uh, yes, any resources on creating interactive tools that can connect to a website would be great. Okay. Yeah, I can, I'll bring those back up at the end. Um, but the HTML widgets gallery is the best resource for a quick view of what's available to R, I would say. There's a few other libraries out there, but it's the biggest sort of one place that I know of to see the choices available. Okay, there is another question, which mm -hmm. is if we were to use a different data set, does the data need to be loaded outside the UI? Yeah, so you you never would load the data inside the UI. You would load it outside, and you would either load it here. Well, it is. And if we put the data here, data here will be loaded when we publish it and then it's available to the app as is. We'll also learn that we can load data here in our server function. And data here will be loaded every time that the app is initialized in a session. So a user session is when you go to the website and you open up that app to start playing with it. The data is loaded every time. So thinking about where data goes can be an important um, decision because you may not want it to load every time. Also, sometimes you have an app where there's no data loading it's the user who uploads. So you would have a file input and the user brings in their data. In that case, their data here is loaded in the server section as well. But you have a widget for them to put in their file name and location, for example. So, all right. Go back to the PowerPoint. For those that worked on adding a radio button, we simply add a second slider. And the important thing to note is that we're building up a fluid page. This is our website. And every element that we add is a new argument. So our slider input was one argument. It's our first element. We have to put a comma and then rate the next object that we're adding, so the radio buttons. So I'll do that really quick to keep up. So comma for my second element radio buttons and have poet show fit and so show show linear fit and this is equal So if I was 
building this if I wanted to have um, my choices represent values to see a different label than what the values they actually are going to represent in my code. I could use a name vector so I could say that you know, no equals zero and yes equals one or something because I'm going to use a yes, a one and a zero is what I want to reference later in my R code. Um, also notice that because the first two items arguments in the inputs are always input ID and label, people often leave them out. So you usually see the code written like this with the label or the input ID and then the label, but without their named arguments. And then the rest of the arguments named because order matters. So wrote it that way. Um, so now if we run this again, we should see that we have our code slider and our um, toggle button. They both are functioning. We now need to connect them to some output. And if we looked at our HTML code, we'd see that we had added a second div, a second section to that body of our um, website. So to build a res whoops, to build a responsive output, we're going to have sort of three pieces that play together. First of all, in our UI section, we're going to have to indicate where we want the output to appear. So we're going to have to make an output location. Just like we had slider inputs, select inputs, checkbox inputs, we have a number of types of output. So we have plot outputs, table outputs. If we've installed some of our other widget packages like leaflet, we have leaflet outputs, etc. They need to have an ID as well. And then they're going to have a corresponding um, piece of code in the server section. So if we have a plot output, then in our server, we're going to have an, an out, a, a place where we define what that output should be. And we will have a render plot for a plot or a render table for a table or a render leaflet for a leaflet. So the names start to be, they tend to be consistent most of the time. So again, referencing the Chinese cheat sheet, there are many types of outputs. So we see here a data table output, image output, plot output, verbatim text output, table text, UI, HTML, and there are others, each of them having their corresponding render um, argument. Some of them are a little bit different, like render print goes with verbatim text output. Um, but most of them are matching. Image output needs a render image. So they only have one required out argument. That'll be their output ID. And again, output ID must uniquely identify one output widget. If you give the same name to two outputs, then your Shiny app won't run. Just like if you give the same name to two inputs, your Shiny app won't run. And just we won't do it, but just to note that some output objects can themselves be used to capture user input. Examples would be image output, where you can define what happens on interactions like click, double click, hover, or brush. And you can do the same sort of thing with some of the plot outputs. You can define what will happen if someone clicks, double clicks, hovers, or brushes over top of that plot. So we're going to just build them as outputs to receive information based on our user input. There is a question from uh -huh. a little while before, if you can show the div. It was ah, sure, I can show the div if you would like to see it. So we ran this with our radio buttons. If I run the app, and then I open in the browser, and then I right click, to view page source. It just, after this, it starts to get longer and longer. It's harder to fit on the screen. But now we have our, find it here. There's our pedal slider. And then here is our radio button. So our radio button is a collection of information. We have our label. There's our show linear fit. 
But then we also have the individual little boxes. So in this case too, so we have a div for the no and a div for the yes. So we're building up this website. Right. So we're gonna add this code um, to our app just really quick first. So we're building a plot and this plot is gonna receive information in the first step just from our slider. And what happens is as they choose their maximum pedal width, we're gonna have um, the same plot appear, but the dots that are red, it's gonna be restricting which ones are shown in red. So as we choose here, we have something just over four, was there chosen 4.3. So only dots below 4.3 are shown in red. And the way that we're gonna do that is that we're gonna define, so first we make a plot output bucket. That's where we want the information to go. So it's like that initializes a null value container. Then, and it's putting it into an object, which is a list-like object called output. We gave it the name iris scatter. So if we want to change the value of the plot output, then output dollar sign iris scatter is going to have to receive our new plot information. So we have render plot. And if you're used to writing functions in R, then again, you notice that we have the curly braces. So we're writing a custom function, putting R code that will run every time we do this render plot function. And we're going to make a subset of our data. So iris sub is going to start with the iris data set, and it's going to filter based on petal length, keeping only those that are less than or equal to this input from the slider. And the way that we access that value or that that value is stored is in another list-like object called input. And the value that we want is located at the position pedal slider. Pedal slider, again, being the ID that we gave to our slider. So these IDs that we use in our user interface become the values that we reference as we're building and working in our server. So plot output is named iris scatter. So the output that we're going to where we're going to place this rendered plot is an output dollar sign iris scatter when we want to use the value that is saved from the user at pedal slider we use input dollar sign pedal slider to reference that value so here where this is 4.3 inputs pedal slider is going to become the value 4.3 Again, if you've worked in for building for loops where you have your I for iteration, and as you iterate through I, that value changes, this is the same concept here, substituting in the value that is being saved above. So let me add that. And I'm going to cheat a little bit by grabbing it from another screen, Notepad++, where I saved bits of code so that you don't have to watch me slowly type. I believe I have it here. Well, I'll type this one in first. So we want our Iris scatter. And then in our server section, we will take do a little bit first and then I'll grab it. Iris sub. It's going to be iris. And very quickly, let me also add the other libraries that I want to add besides library shiny, I add outside of all of this code. So my libraries are loaded outside of the UI and the server code, and they'll be run before the website is built. So I'm also going to be using library 
dplyr. Library Mac Reader for pipe. And library ggplot2 for my graphs. And that should be all that I need for this. Iris. Dplyr. Sorry, this is going to be output dollar sign. Iris scatter. Ender plot. And then I will copy the bits. I think that closes. And the double parentheses are here, like where you see the round parentheses and the curly braces, because the curly braces are going to be inside the curly braces is going to be the R code that generates the plot that we want to render. So this is the, um, the part that's going to be sent to the R server to run. We can also add other arguments here on our render plot. We could specify particular size or resolution. There's some other characteristics of the graphic that we could potentially um, modify at the time of rendering. That's a little more advanced and we won't do that. We're just gonna be making it process some R code. So let me check if this works. Reload the app. It's gonna ask me again to save it and did not see it when it nothing shows up, but I don't get an error. That usually means that I have a typo and I've asked to see something that doesn't actually exist. So I have plot output, iris scatter. And that is what it is named. There's a render plot. Oh. And like a regular plot, the last thing, like a regular function, a function returns the last object that you've, the result of the last line that was run, or you have to explicitly ask for an object to be returned. So either this last line of code will be what is returned. And then I have my plot, which responds, yes. So as I change, the limit, it's simply showing, I see all the data in the gray dots, but the ones that are colored red are changing. And this is happening because what I did was I made my subset and I made a ggplot, which has all of the data in the background, colored light gray. And then just this subset of data that has been filtered by petal length, colored red. So. This is the filtered set of data. And again, we'll have we won't have added another div, but we'll have added functionality via the render plot. So we have a simple plot. So right now we're only working from this slider. Let's suppose that we also want to work from this show a linear fit or not. So what we're gonna do now is we're not gonna modify our UI because that's not the part that we're changing. We're again gonna work within our server section. And just like to use or to reference the value from the slider input, we had input pedal slider using the name of the slider input we're going to need to use input show fit if we want to reference the radio button values. And these can be either a yes or no. So what I did was I changed my code to make a plot object. And then I said, if 
input show fit equals yes, go ahead and add a geom smooth to that plot. So this code will only run if the value of input show fit equals yes. So we go back to my R code. And this was why I had the object. So now I need to make a temporary object that I can modify. So I'll make my plot ggplot. And then I'll say that I want to do paste. So I create the object my plot. And if show fit equals yes, then I want my plot to be replaced or updated by adding the geom smooth to the line. And then to make sure that something is returned, return, um, we'll return my plot at the end. So it'll either be just this plot if show fit equals no, or it'll be with the smooth line if it equals yes. So we selected run it. So now make sure that the functionality of my slider still works. And if I ask to see the show fit line, it fits a line. And if I reduce my data, it fits the line to the reduced set. And that's because my data here is still for the smooth line is using the iris sub, the subset that I filtered by pedal length. So for folks that might be following along coding on their own, there is one other simple exercise, which is simply to add a geom, a vertical line to the plot. You can use it by adding a geom V line. I don't want it to be conditional. It's not something people are choosing, so it should always be there. And so you can put it within the same render plot function in the first part of where we built the ggplot. So I'll give this is very quick, um, maybe just like two more minutes, and then I'll show the answer and we'll keep going. Are there any other questions? Sorry, did you see the message about an error message? Um, do you see that in the chat? Nope, I don't see chat with the way I have my screen set up. Um, oh, okay, gotcha. I'll I'll take a look at it. And see if, okay. Yeah, they they sent a screenshot, so I'll have to take a look at that and see if I can figure out what's going on. Okay. Sorry, I'm when I'm live coding, I make so many little typo errors. So sometimes. <laughs> yeah, so the the error message says, warning message, our graphics engine version 15 is not supported by this version of our studio. The plots tab will be disabled until a newer version of our studio is installed. So it sounds like you sound have like to- like a shiny thing. <laughs> yeah, no, it definitely sounds like you should. <laughs> You, the the fix would be to install a, a more recent version of our studio. I can go ahead and drop a link in the chat for that. Okay, thank you. The errors that you're most likely to get as a beginner relate to missing commas, missing parentheses, kind of normal stuff in R, or the behavior of like an object just doesn't appear, especially in an output object, and that it's a typo between what you named it and then what you called when you tried to use it or to put a value into it is a really common error, typo or capitalization difference. Um, kind of the same things always for coding in R that you think there's a major problem and then you discover it was just a typo. 
All right, so unhide the answer. All that you needed to do was to add this line 21, which is the geom V line. And you're going to add an X intercept that you want this yellow line to appear at the value of the input pedal slider that was chosen. And then I made mine yellow colored, which you could as well. So if we add that, just modifying our ggplot code, geom V line, and we say X intercept equals input dollar sign, uh, whatever the pedal slider will be. Color equals goldenrod and then close. We run our app, we can double check that that worked. Move our slider, fit our line. And things seem to be working. So we can again, um, let's say that we want to add a second output to this, this uh, little app. We're going to add a table output to the UI and a render table in the server, because again, these pieces go together. So whatever we name our table output in the UI is going to have to be given a name, a unique ID. And then when we want to render that table, that code is going to go in the server section, and we're going to be saying output dollar sign, whatever ID you gave that table output in the UI, that's the output dollar sign, the name of that object to which you want to render a table. In my mind, I think of them as buckets, output buckets, and then I'm rendering into a particular output bucket that shares that name. So in this function, we're going to again have to subset the data based on the slider input. So what we want to do is if so some code is going to be repeated, that I use the dplyr code, the filter, will be repeated based on the pedal length input, and then it's just going to summarize the number of observations by species. So after subsetting, um, if you are used to working with the tidyverse, group by and summarize are a quick way to do that. So whatever you call your subset of data, group it by species, and then summarize it to get the number of records per species. And as the user decreases, um, the pedal, maximum pedal length value, what's going to happen is this table will also update to say how many of each of the species we have in that reduced set. So this question. one. Also, yep. There's a question. Uh, is it always necessary to use dplyr? No. Oh, like this. I do this whenever I'm teaching just because I don't know that everybody knows where package they're from, but this is using package name and then function name. So just because it helps most of my students to remember. And you don't have to. N is also from the package dplyr. But if you have the library dplyr loaded, you do not have to use the colon dplyr colon colon in front of your functions. The only other reason that I do it, and I do do it sometimes, um, is that if you dplyr has a lot of functions and if you're really, really being tight on memory, instead of loading the whole library and making all of the functions available, you can choose to only use the particular function that you want at the moment when you want it. Um, that's less relevant in a Shiny app because you're going to have to bring in the library so that the Shiny server can use it. So this I'll give a few minutes again. And then we'll, on the next slide, look at the code.
And you definitely, I mean, following up on that question, you definitely don't have to use ggplot or tidyverse things within Shiny. That just is because I'm also a tidyverse instructor, just spent, was in Spain teaching a tidyverse class and a ggplot class. Um, so they're what I use all the time when I code, but I'm not aware of any particular advantage to using tidyverse and ggplots in my Shiny apps versus using some base R or using data table or anything else. Um, I think all the same advantages and disadvantages apply regarding efficiency and readability that would apply when you're coding any place else in R. So I can keep going. Usually when I'm teaching, I get to put people in breakout rooms, but I was informed that not everyone would be at a place where they could potentially do the exercises. Um, so to complete this exercise, there's again two, you have to modify both the UI component and the server component. In the UI component, we're gonna add one more piece. So that means comma, to make a new argument for the new piece, and then the table output and give it a unique name. I called mine spur table. In the server component, we're gonna make a new piece, but in this case, we don't have to use a comma. We're writing the code that we write in the fluid page. Fluid page is a function. So each piece that we add is one more argument. The server component is a custom function that we are building. And so it is just, we're just creating functions, more functions inside the function. In this case, it's the render table function. So again, I filter, I create iris sub, I filter pedal length based on the input from the pedal length slider from input dollar sign pedal slider. And then I'm doing the next two steps in sequence with the pipe, grouping by species and summarizing by the number of records that are present. And if I add this to my code, this is a little bit bigger, Let's see if I remove some spaces. So that's one chunk of code that we wrote. Second one that we write output dollar sign. This was the table. But first, let me add it. What I want table output. It's the table. And then output square table is assigned render table. So these are the, the pattern. Table output with a name goes to output with the same name and is built with a render table. And here I will grab. Code input pedal slider matches the same name. Run the app. And now we have a small table. If I reduce and move my slider, change the limit, I see that my table is now also responsive to the same subset, the same slider information. And if I change my yes and no, the line appears and disappears, but it is not modifying the second table because there is nothing in this render table that references the input from the fit line widget. 
So if I put something in here, I might be able to show that, well, I won't be able to show. So these functions are reactive functions that work with reactive values. Input pedal slider is a reactive value. Anytime input slider changes, everything that depends on pedal slider will, up, will be updated. It'll become invalidated and then it will update. Everything that depends on input show fit will update whenever someone modifies on the input show fit. If you dig deeper and go further in learning Shiny apps, there is a lot to learn about. We think of it as we touch a thing and then the thing changes. In fact, it's kind of reversed where the thing becomes invalidated, then it goes and looks for new values, um, which always seems a little difficult to wrap your head around that component of reactivity. Um, But for now, for beginning, the idea that the objects change when the input um, becomes invalidated, when the values themselves change is close enough to truth. So we have two pieces in our plot or in our app, but we've introduced some redundancy. So both of these components are doing the same subset step. And it probably makes sense to pull that out and put it separate. So building the inputs and the outputs and connecting them is the really easy part of Shiny and about what we cover in a two hour session. As you go deeper into Shiny and build more complex apps, the challenging part becomes managing the reactivity. So again, from the Shiny, Shiny cheat sheet, there is a figure in there of all the different ways that you can sort of have reactivity and manage reactivity in your app. The purpose of managing reactivity is you want to control the app behavior. That could be the timing, um, the sequence of events, et cetera, but also to improve efficiency, to not be doing the same thing twice. So if we're subsetting data and then writing a paragraph about it, making a plot with it, and making a table with it, we don't want to be doing the subset three times because that's three times the work. We want to instead make a set of reactive values, a reactive data object, so that it's created once, but then consumed by three different products, a plot, a table, and a paragraph. So the app that we made so far, it has these inputs. And we've just used the example input, um, slider input, radio buttons, there's a bunch of other types of inputs that we could have. And we've dealt with the very other opposite end, the outputs, which are made with the render functions. In here, you can see there's ways to remove reactivity, um, event-based reactivity. This would be like if you made a button. So suppose that you had a bunch of sliders and text input and toggles, and you wanted someone to be able to make all of their choices without changing anything until they press a button, right? So this would be like they're going to make some sort of model, and you don't want the model to run with, e with each individual choice that they make, which data, which variables. You want to wait till they've made all of their choices and then run the full model with all of those specifications. You'd be doing some event reactivity. Um, and then there's observers, et cetera. So there is, it quickly gets very deep in the ways that you can manage code. We're going to add just one little extra piece and that we're going to create a reactive data object to be consumed both by our table and our plot so that we're not creating the data twice. So we'll use a reactive function to do that. So and where this data is, so notice this is I make my iris sub, I filter based on the input slider in my render plot. And then in my render table, it was also the first step I made the iris sub when I filtered by the pedal slider. As is, it's running it twice. And also that 
this render plot is going to run is going to run every time someone changes either the slider or the fit line and i maybe want to modify that these are the triggers for the render plot so move it into the reactive so i'm going to create iris sub it's going to be an object it's actually it's going to be a function created with the reactive function and all it's going to do is to subset the data based on the input from the slider. I'm going to take this subset component of my code out of the render plot and out of the render table. And instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that my data equals iris sub, but with parentheses that are empty. And what's happening is every time this iris sub is used, it's running this reactive expression. But when the render plot updates to iris sub, this render table is going to also be aware that iris sub updated and use the same information. So it will only have to run this once. It'll run it once when either of the two pieces are updated. And the main mistake that people make with writing code when they start building these reactive functions to build um, reactive data and reactive values is that they forget later in their code to put these parentheses after that, that it's not a data object anymore. It's a function that creates a data object. And then you get the message that the object is not found and you know that you created it and trying to remember that you need it. So let me add that to our code really quickly. So what we're going to do is create iris sub and say that this is going to be a reactive function created with a reactive function. And we take our code and put it up here. And then we can remove it from here. And where we wanted iris sub data that we created before, now we want the iris sub function that will produce some subset data for us. And again, here, we no longer need iris sub filtering. Instead, what we will have is iris sub data created with the iris sub function and then summarized. This should, in theory, work just the same. There should be no real noticeable difference in how it functions up oh, unused argument list. So what have I done? Have iris sub reactive inside its two sets of braces built by iris slider. That's the same. Turn my clock really quick. I don't know if you don't use the shortcut of control I to re indent lines, it becomes very, very useful when you're building um, shiny apps because the indenting is very helpful in debugging the code. Um, iris table, render table, sub is what I called it. You do get some notices in the debugging of data. It thinks that this is a list. If you want to view a thing, putting your little clicking on the margin puts a little red dot, the browser dot. If we then reload the app, it should open a browser in that location so I'm able to see the data at that point. So if I ask to see um, 
the environment is empty because I haven't yet run it. It only has one step. And it runs just fine. So maybe I just had something. Let me stop it and then run the app again. That part works, but I've broken, broken my output, spit a table. Double check my notes. Um, I don't know if they ever come from in line 34, you have an Irish sub, but you don't have the parentheses. Oh, yes, thank there you. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. And now, uh, hopefully, there we go. That was it. So, like I said, one of the biggest problems is not adding the parentheses, looking for the object instead of looking for the function after we make the reactive function to make reactive data. So now we have an app, but it's not at all pretty. It's just showing, it's producing, it's giving the behavior that we want with the components that we want. The next bit is to add a tiny bit of styling and structure to our app. Back to PowerPoint. So organizing and styling, sort of three different aspects to this. One is adding H simple HTML elements. So again, looking at the shiny cheat sheet, um, we can directly add HTML elements. If you know any HTML code, there is um, H1 for level one headers, H2, H3, H4, different size text, and you can style headers um, in various ways. The headers are also a very important uh, tool for accessibility because screen readers and tools um, that read websites for folks will use those to organize information. Um, so ideally, if you're just wanting big font and little font, you're not going to use your headers for that. You'll use your headers to help organize information. Um, there's also ways to make strong, bold text, um, P for making a new paragraph of text, A for, a for inserting links. And so you can either use tags dollar sign and then you're adding in these elements, or some are so commonly used that they have their own little wrapper functions in R. So they show here in the cheat sheet that tags h1 header is the same thing or will produce in the HTML the header one tag. Um, code. So in our slider, we're just going to, or in our app, the goal, again, looking up at our beginning, we want to have some sort of header text at the top. And then exercise is going to be that you guys add a little more text at the bottom. So if we want to simply add, scroll down to back where I was, some text. We again, the fluid page is a function, so we have to add an argument. We add the H1 demonstration app. So I'll go into our code and add H1. Demonstration app, remembering to add the comma. So it's separated from the following one. If we run the app, Now we have some text ready to serve as a title. So we could add any other text in here that we wanted or links, et cetera. Oops, back to PowerPoint. So HTML elements are pretty straightforward. Simple HTML elements are pretty straightforward to add. Structure is a little more complicated. 
structure can be added. There are some predefined layouts that you can use. One of the examples would be if we go to R and say that we want a new file, you may have opened Shiny Web App. Uh, give it a quick name. Oops, and I just use a directory. New file. Web App. on the desktop. So when we open the, this is just the default Shiny app, we see again a fluid page with some elements separated by commas. They use a sidebar layout and sidebar panels, so a predefined layout. We run the app, it's the standard. There is a title, there is a left side for widgets and a right side for outputs. If we want to have the ability to directly modify how we arrange things, we're going to use fluid rows and columns. So the screen is thought of as having 12 units of width. So you can divide your screen into rows. Every row will have the potential to have up to 12 columns. And you can choose how you want to arrange the space. So we make a fluid row. And then we, we can just fill that fluid row with information. It'll be arranged in, in space vertically. Or we can say that we want to have two columns, each with width six. Or we want three columns, each with width four. Four columns, each with width three, et cetera. If we wanted to create a, an app that had two fluid rows, the top row had a column of width four, and then some empty space, and then a second column of width two, and then some more empty space, in the second row, having the full width used by a container for objects, we would have our fluid page, our first fluid row, a column width four, and then whatever we want to put in that column and slider input, checkbox input, radio input, plot output, a paragraph that we write, etc. Column of width two, offset two. So the offset is to create a space between the previous the new column and the previous column. And another fluid row using the full width for the objects that are placed there. So either we use one of the predefined layouts, and there are several, or we're building it ourselves. We're going to make something that looks very similar to the um, sidebar panel, slightly wider panel, slightly um, larger plot but we're going to do it with fluid row and, and columns. So wireframing is, so usually before the very first step when I would be making an app or working with a client for what they imagine their app would look like is we're sketching things out on paper. And then I'm taking that sketch and working at what is the structure. So this really simple app is going to have, has one wide area and then it has a row that has two columns. I'm putting all of my widgets in one column, the plot in the other. Etc. And I actually even will note on this, you know, what are my notes for what their IDs are going to be, um, for how their dependencies are going to run. And then these become really useful references as I design them um, and as I talk back and forth with the client. And there's actually whole apps that help you build out wireframing uh, sketches, because most of my apps are smaller, it tends to be more on paper and PowerPoint. Let's put these into our app. Actually, one more piece first. So the other piece of adding styling, we can add text elements or simple HTML elements, links, images, etc. We can arrange where we want it to be in space with fluid rows and columns. Other things that we might want to change are changed with our cascading style sheets. And there's three ways that we can modify the default values of our cascading style sheet. By default, the style that we have for our website is a bootstrap style. Um, we can either completely replace that. Um, we can get load some other packages that give us other options. We can also write a .css um, set of instructions for our 
to alter our, cask our styles, our CSS code. Or what we'll do in this app is we can modify things directly in line. If there's just one small change that we want to make in one location, we can add that directly. So in one column, we're going to give it a different background color than the default. So we'll say style equals background color, dark slate gray. So these color names are the same color names that you would find if you Google for the R colors that are available, or you could use your hex values for colors. Um, and it has to be written in quotes because we're passing this string of text directly into um, to substitute for what is in the default CSS. So we're placing some values. The other thing we're going to do is you can modify the instructions, the style instructions that are in the head. So in the tags head, that header section, we have the head section of our HTML and the body section of our HTML. We've been adding inputs and outputs and text to the body. We can modify a component of the head by giving some special style instructions there. And it always has to be set up this way with tags head, tags style, and then a chunk of HTML code to modify, to insert in there. In this case, in the example that I use, we import a uh, fancy font. We change the background color of the whole body of our app and the font color. And then we also change the styling of H1 headers. So any place that we put an H1 header, it will have this new style, font family, this fancy font family. And then the font will be the dark slate gray color as well. The fact that you have to write some CSS to modify the CSS hopefully demonstrates how you don't go very far in making really custom looking apps without having to learn some CSS as well as the R that you already know. Um, so let's modify a little bit here. We're gonna close the default app, go back to our app. So the first thing is to do a quick, um, where did I add our, first we're gonna modify, we added our text, we're gonna modify our structure. And let me look at it. So we're gonna say that we have, right after our header, we're gonna put in a fluid row. And we want this first fluid row to end Two rows. I want the table not to be at the very end. I want the table to appear in this first column. I have to make sure that my commas all work. And this is where the control I for indent can be helpful because I can see where my fluid row starts and where it ends. Each of the elements that will appear in this fluid row need to be separated by commas, so I have three elements, one, two commas, and the last one has no comma. This fluid row has one element only, so no comma there. And I see the closing parentheses. So I've put it in fluid rows, that gets me partway there. Actually, I only have one fluid row that I want, so I don't want this one fluid row, put in the comma, and we're going to have two columns. First column is going to have width equals four, and this column will end where well, I was going to end the fluid row. And then we will have a second column with width equals, it has to sum to 12, so eight. Close the column and re indent that. So I have a fluid row. The fluid row closes here. 
And in that fluid row, I have two columns. One has width four plus three elements. Second one has width eight and one element. So the width is one argument, and then each of the components that I'm adding are also an argument. Pass to the column. The columns are arguments passed to fluid row. Fluid row is one of the arguments passed to fluid page. So this nestedness, when you have a really complicated app, can start to look really messy. And this indenting, again, becomes really useful to help you in this sort of long format way of writing your code can also be really helpful as opposed to letting your lines wrap or writing really wide code. Um, to help you keep track of where your open and closed parentheses are and where your commas are forgotten by accident. So let's run that and double check. Should now be arranged in space as we want. So title, things on the side, plot on the right. Next step is to add our modifications to some style. So we want to add, again, I always need to check my CSS, which is, I am less fast at than coding R. The column not that one. Check my PowerPoint. It's the first one that I want to change. The first column. I want to have the background color be dark slate gray. So style equals. And this is added as an argument, so separated by commas. I think one of the trickiest things with getting these correct is because this is written as CSS, is knowing that a switch, that something that is different from writing code in R, instead of having an equal sign, using the colon is a common mistake that people make a typo. Writing background color equals dark slate gray instead of background color colon dark slate gray or writing in a different language for this chunk of this string of code. Also, not putting quotes on the color names, whether they're given as text names or hex names, they do not get quotes. Um, and that can be another common typo that I see in folks in beginners apps. So this should add background color. Dark slate gray. Nope, oh, but it's on the wrong one. Control cut, put it up here. Run the app. So I have the dark slate gray there. Kind of not looking as nice here. Then we want to add our CSS bit. So this is a little more complicated code. I have to say that what we're modifying inside our fluid page, we're going to modify the head. And in the head, we're going to modify the style commands. And we're going to do this with a long chunk of HTML. And I'm going to copy this from the other side so I don't have to type it out. Ashton, sorry yep. to interrupt, but uh, I just wanted to quickly let you know that we are at 7.30. OK, yep, we are. These are the last step besides a little exercise. It goes till. 
8, but you need time for your announcement, correct? Or does it go to 7.30? I had 8. <laughs> oh, did I say? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm confused now. The meetup page says 8. Arthi. Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bad. All right. I was like, I had timed every slide. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, sorry, we'll, be done. we'll be done well before 8 for questions. <laughs> All right, let me double check if I have all the quotes in the right place, because they're not going to be in the right place. Um, HTML. Think what I did. Tag set, tag style, HTML. This one closes here, style closes there, head closes there, and then we have a comma because the next element is H1. All right, and then we have our white font, and it's a little more readable. Still not beautiful, lots of things I'd want to do differently if I was actually making something for a client. Um, one thing is that as we're building it and making edits, especially as we start to add some styling and layout, is always clicking on open in browser. This view that you have in the little shiny viewer is not always the same as the view that you have in an actual browser. Um, so opening in browser to see what it would really look like. I have a super wide high resolution screen, so things are very stretched. And the other thing that you might check in a browser is just how does it behave if you know someone's resizing their monitor. We're using a fluid page as opposed to a fixed page or certain other kinds of pages that you can have. Because in theory, a fluid page is going to be the best choice for um, deciding how it should rearrange the elements as someone resizes their screen. If they go to look at this app on their phone, which is tall and skinny, right? It's gonna put the things from the left at the top and the things from the right at the bottom. So it will still work. Um, but remembering to check what it looks like. So we have a demonstration app. We have a little bit of color. I was going to have you guys practice, but I think I'm just going to show you where it goes because um, I think it's hard to type in unless you're pulling from the exercise where all of that CSS stuff goes. Um, but if you wanted to add now another piece of texture, just finding the place where it goes. So we have two columns of information. We want to add this text, then we want to add it at the as the last element of this first column. So we go back to our app, we find our first column. Right now it ends with a table. If we want to add one more element, we add it as an argument. We're gonna say that we'll add it as H4 text, breaking the, the recommendation that I gave you earlier of not to make font sizes, using the headers for font size, using it instead for organizational information. If we want to create just words, we would use P for entering some text, and then we'd be able to define a style specific to certain um, text components. But that is, again, a more advanced topic than a two hour lecture. So we're going to cheat a little bit, um, use an H4, and say that this is our ladies. Um, Washington, D.C. Hey, Ashton, um, there is a question in the sure. chat. Um, it says, where did you pull the import um, URL? Yeah, that. So where's 
that from? How did I know to use this? Yeah. It is a, just like a lot of coding in R, Googling for how to add, I mean, I happen to have used Google app, Google fonts in other apps, but it's by Googling for how to get a Google font and use it um, in my shiny app. And yeah. actually- so, And so that's CSS <laughs> code, right? <clears throat> Yes, so it's confusing because you're you're putting it in HTML because it's going to be it's CSS instructions inserted via HTML. So if I run this, which it should do, because I just added um, the, an H4 text, which I have given an assigned color. Um, if I open this in the browser and open back up my browser, right click on it. It's going to have a lot more stuff in it now. So the view page source, we should be able to see. There is the chunk of code that we added, right? Um, so this is CSS code, but it's added directly into our HTML document. So if I had written instead, um, let's see if I have a, the other option, which is more complicated is that I write a CSS um, file. Just trying to see if I had one quickly at hand. I think I do teaching. Actually, I have one from www. So this would be an example. I don't think I can make this view bigger. I can a little bit zoom in. So actually, here's another one where I had an example of importing a font. This one's a balsamic sans special font, changing some characteristics of margins and background colors. Um, I think I think the question that I'm now that I'm reading it again, I think it it might be about that link that's inside of the call. How do I know this bit? Yeah. Yep. So I think if I see if I can make it. Quickest way to get to what I want. Choose a font. So this is, I don't know if you do much coding, you might or might not be familiar with the W3 schools resources. They have many, many languages and then it's kind of like a giant dictionary or encyclopedia. They have little tutorials too. They're sometimes helpful, sometimes not. Um, but if I want to know how I'm modifying fonts via my CSS, or if I want to know how I'm modifying color applications or outlines or alignments or image inserts, other things, this is often where I start. Um, well, I usually start with something R shiny and what I want. If that doesn't immediately get me an answer that I want, or it gets me close, but I need to know a little more CSS to actually implement that example in my own use case, I take what I learned from that example, go here to W3Schools. Um, so they're showing us again an example of a font. I don't know if they tell us, tells us how to add it. Doesn't tell us how to get them oh, for a list of all available Google fonts, which was probably what I ended up doing. Here they are and do they have, it's grayed out, but potentially for any of the fonts that I want, I can try it. And does it show me the actual link? Yes, and I can copy and paste my link that I need. So one way of many to figure out what the Google font is that you want. If you are going to use the Google fonts, um, I think
think in a shiny you can use them directly because it's working through a web browser so it's it knows google um if you're trying to use google fonts in something like just a ggplot outside of a web app i know that you have to download and make that font available on your local system so just be aware of that so i think we have our app and it looks like what we want so title in a slightly different font different background colors reactivity working like we want as we add more or less change our max length, we're getting more or less examples of our species. It's not super exciting. I think my this laptop is set up so I can publish just to show you what happens. But if we decide we're done and we're happy and we want to publish an app, there will be a there's the publish button up in the side. You have to have created a Shiny Apps account or have your own server set up. And in R, real quick here, you would have set up that connection. I believe it's under global options for publishing. What are your accounts? So I have set up, followed the instructions. I have, I bought Shiny Apps account. There's also free, free tiers. Um, I followed the instructions for how to set it up in our studio so that I could publish to it, um, set up my SSL certificates, etc. It's now available to me. So when I view it in the website, I can publish. This is seeing all sorts of stuff because I have it not in my, I didn't make a project. Normally you would want to put it in its own folder and or make a project. I just want my one little setup R. And the title is test. See if it will publish from there. It won't do it unless I put it into a project, which I didn't do from this laptop, which is not my laptop. Um, so sorry, I wasn't planning to show you guys how to publish. It'll go through a series of steps. Said it's preparing it, bundling it, publishing it, and it appears on the Shiny Apps IO account. Um, Well, we'll see. I'll take questions instead. I think the that is the last sort of slide. That was the code that we had, adding the tags, adding the H4 text. In terms of quick reference, as you noticed, the cheat sheet is helpful. I when I'm if I haven't been doing a shiny project for a while and then I come back to shiny, reference it quickly for just quick what are the argument names, what is the syntax. Um, the other super useful resource is the Shiny R Studio. Um, some of these links are in the process of changing. It's now Posit instead of R Studio. So um, I noticed the cheat sheets have already changed their branding, but the Shiny site has not. It still is an rstudio.com. But there's a whole bunch of there's the gallery. Uh, of different examples that you can follow. The articles kind of take you through from a first shiny app to each of the components that you might want to modify. So it's a go at your own pace for a free tutorial if you're following through these. Um, anyway, there's a bunch of things in here that are useful. The gallery and articles are the two I use the most. If you really want to go deeper, learn more. Ah, wait, these got the wrong slides on there. It'd be not the ggplot books, which I also recommend, but that is from my other class. I will show you the one. I need to update what's on the Dropbox. The Shiny book by Hadley, Mastering Shiny. I can go not to the image, but to the actual link. 
is probably the main textbook. Um, it's gone through a couple iterations. And if you looked at it a couple years ago and found it not to be super intuitive or a little frustrating, it's definitely improved over the last couple of years based on feedback that users have provided to improve the language and the examples. Um, I've gone through it once as a class, like with a user group we went through as a book club through the book and found it really helpful for improving our shiny. Um, but it's the main book that I would recommend if you want to learn more. It's good um, to hear that it's had some updates because I remember <laughs> seeing the first version and thinking, oh my God, I can't follow this. What's happening? <laughs> yeah. And I really think that going through the R Studio, like just the basic little tutorials or going through and building your own really simple using that widgets page. So the one that was the shiny widgets. So just thinking like making basically an app like we just built. So it has one simple graphic or one simple table or maybe one of each, one or two widgets to touch it and see how that works. And if that, the, the, the amount that I showed you today, you could see how those pieces fit together, then that book is much more helpful. And we all kind of agree that there were about 12 of us that went through together as a book club. And we felt that it was not so great as a starting point. Like the first time I use Shiny, I start with chapter one. Um, but for those of us that had a little more Shiny, it was really, really helpful to kind of start putting together the pieces of what we've learned to do but not necessarily known why. Um, and it definitely helped us improve our apps and the efficiency of our apps, especially with those reactive elements. Yeah, that, that's really good advice about starting very small and, and doing things one at a time. I I found in my experience that Shiny um, is one of those ones that it's gonna make you be really disciplined of only changing like one thing at a time and then checking. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because you, you can't write like 10 lines of code and then run it without yeah, checking. <laughs> one thing at a time and things that are really useful, um, like in the server section, super easy tools. Like when you're building a thing, you don't want it to be the This is so simple that sometimes it's hard. Um, but, you know, adding small bits of code that say print head of. So I can add a print message and this should work. So I have to make this smaller so that I can bring up my console. Right, so I can add little print statements. I can't do it in the UI section, but I can do it in the server section. And then as I am changing things, like very few things, like head is probably the best choice, but right, I'm going to see little messages to myself. So that can be really useful for debugging things. And then I can comment them out when I'm done. I can also put in the browser. I have to have kind of more complicated code for the browser to be useful. But again, this opens a window where if you're familiar with writing functions, you know that you have your global environment and that that is different from your function environment. So the browser will open to that function environment and you can see objects that you've created there. You can manipulate them and see if your code is working correctly or not. And that can be really helpful. Um, you can also just put in a browser, actually. You could do this like, it's the same as doing this browser. If I put in, this one has two pieces. So maybe if I, put in a browser. Yeah, I have my plot. So from browser. And I draw it. And can I ask to see? No, I don't have a complicated enough object to make it uh, to demonstrate how the browser works. I need to have more code. But if you've used it in other cases of debugging functions that you've written, it works exactly the same in Shiny. Um, 
The difference is that you cannot use it in the UI section. You can, you can only use it in the server section. Because this is one big long, the UI is one big long function. And you can't put a browser in the middle of a function. You can only put arguments into a single function. Other questions? Yeah, there, there is a question that says, um, after I add the CSS style, I could not update the UI anymore. It just runs the style select section. How can I run the entire code? So it should still, like if I run the app, it's running the whole thing. So it must somehow think that it is finished. So for example, I'm not sure what would happen if I closed it by accident. I would think it would give an error about that part. I get an error has occurred. I'm not sure how it would run only the style bit. If you So if you highlight each of these sections are themselves just a function, right? So h1, this function creates the HTML text or the text with the HTML tags in order to insert it in our website. If I run just plot output, it creates a div to receive a plot. If I run just the column bit, I have a div with a div, div column with a div with a plot. So if you run only one section that is highlighted, like the style section, it's going to show you the generated style chunk of code. So I'm not sure, without seeing a shared screen, it's hard to know what's happening, but each of, that's the only way I know that you could run just the style bit. So there's five minutes left. Brady, I know you have an announcement. I can take more questions or I could, we could share a screen with someone whose thing is not working. But that was what I had. My last slide is just thank you. <laughs> And my LinkedIn link and my email if someone has questions later, if they're trying to run something and it's not going, I'm usually happy to answer questions. Um, thank you so much, Ashton. Thank um, you so thanks much. for this excellent presentation. Really appreciate it. Um, not an announcement so much as just a plug for our next meetup. Um, so thanks to everybody who joined today. Um, and do join us again for our next meetup, which is on December 15th at 6 p.m. and will be a virtual kind of social event with some trivia where you can um, interact with others and also give us some feedback about what you'd like to see in these sessions next year. Um, Sam, I don't know if you want to add anything or... I was just about to put the link to RSVP in the chat. So there's the link for our next event. And thanks again, Ashton. We really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you, you so for much. the opportunity. <laughs> okay, if, let me just quickly check the chat. Yep, nothing else. All right, thanks everyone. And we will be posting the recording to the Our Ladies Global YouTube site, um, maybe in a day or two. All right. All right, thank thanks. You. Bye everyone. Thank you Bye. so much. Thanks everyone. See you next month.